25, and I didn't know I wasn't free. I was 28 years of age. I was living in London. And I was coming back to Ireland to go to the police station in Wexford to report the fact that for three years I'd been raped and abused by a Roman Catholic priest. But I didn't know I wasn't free. So I named that, and I went back to London. And within a few months of getting back to London, I heard that another five men had now come forward and made statements as soon as the questions had started to be asked about the case. And within 12 months, I knew that the Catholic Church at a very high level in Ireland at least had known of what was, happened, what, what was happening and that many in the community also knew. And within 18 months, I discovered that the Vatican, that the Holy See had been informed, that, the, that much had been said and many efforts had been, had been made over the years including before the time uh, that I was first assaulted to try and prevent what was happening. And I got really, really angry. I remember the moment when I understood the depth of the outrage uh, that I was being confronted by. The depth of knowledge that existed. The fact that somehow in a, in a country where I grew up, where I was told, be good and everything will be okay that those who are better and more powerful than you must be listened to and must be obeyed. Not to rock the boat, not to be too much, not to stand up, not to speak out, not to be bold. That all of these things had happened to me and many other people uh, precisely because we dared not be bold. We dared not stand up and speak out. And I was furious. At that point, I couldn't be furious for myself because and here's where I discovered that I was not free. I was a prisoner of that great Irish oppression, shame. I felt shame. I felt guilty of a crime that I had not committed. I felt responsible for the things that had been done for me, for the things that I was saying that would upset and hurt and disturb and disrupt. And I felt shame. And it was only a sense of... Uh, the, of, of the scale and size of that injustice that pulled me out of the personal aspect of that experience, that made it about something that was not about me, that was about other people. Because at that stage, my shame meant that I didn't matter enough, I didn't matter enough to be angry about. But the fact that this had happened to other people uh, brought from me a sense of outrage, a sense of injustice that, that forced me I into action. That action then led, led to me, uh, over the next two years, taking on a, a battle and a campaign against the church and against the state that led ultimately, ultimately uh, to me suing the Pope. The reason why I mention all of that is because there was a point in that journey when it wasn't enough to say that it wasn't about me. There was a point in that journey where I had to confront the fact that if these things happening to other people mattered, then it had to matter that it happened to me too. I was blessed with that moment that lifted me out of that very personal experience. It, it dragged me up and out of a shame that I don't believe I ever could have been able to confront or find a way through. And then the journey that I embarked upon caused me to have to come back and revisit what that experience uh, was uh, for myself. And freedom from shame was the beginning of a discovery of the truth of who I am. Freedom from shame and understanding that I was not responsible for the things that were done to me allowed me to begin to think about who I might be in the world and the things that I might do. And if there is a wish that I would have, if there was a hope that I have for us as a country, is that we would understand how much we inflict upon ourselves and upon each other, a level of toxic shame that holds us all back and holds us all down, that stops us from loving ourselves and loving each other as powerfully as we might, that, presents us, that prevents us from living from the truth of our own humanity. So for me, the thing I pray for above all else, for us as a people, is that we find the capacity to name the depth of our shame, to understand that it has no logic. My journey into breaking free from it 
caused me, first of all, just to name it. So I sat in a room with a woman who told me I had nothing to be ashamed about, and I repeated back to her, because she was wise and I was not, that she was right. I had nothing to be ashamed about. And I did that repeatedly with therapists of many kind uh, over a period of about a year, until somebody said to me, it's not true, is it? You keep saying you've nothing, uh, uh, you know that it's not your fault, uh, and that you've nothing to feel ashamed about, but, but you don't believe it. And in that moment, I was finally free to begin to say what I felt. So there is no logic to the shame that we carry because it's a shame that comes down across generations. It's a shame that's used to control and silence and deny. So the thing I wish for is that we take possession of the simple fact that we are a people who have been oppressed by and in many ways consumed by shame. Let's not try and work out where it came from just now. Let's just own it and sit with it. Let's not use our intellect to try to dismiss it because that won't work because it's old and it's deep. Let's just own it. And in time, we will be free of it. So that's my wish. Thank you.